So after Sheikh's uh, introduction into the topic of this conference, which is the ayat li ulil albab, which are the signs of Allah Azza wa Jal, for the people who ponder and reflect. And reflection and contemplation is an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. Allah says, do you not then ponder upon the Qur'an? And likewise, by extension, to ponder upon the signs of Allah, the things around us. So questioning and reflecting and contemplating or pondering, these are things that are not only ordered, but advised, recommended acts, because it leads to a person to realize the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, there are people that question and ponder and they are still deprived from the guidance. They have a disease in their heart. But someone who's open and someone who genuinely wants for himself guidance, then there is no way that someone seeks guidance and Allah leaves him astray. So the topic that the Sheikh gave me is the eye, the human eye. And maybe I know about the human eye a little bit more than a normal person just because I studied it for many years. But to be honest, even after so many years of studying this organ and studying subjects relating to the eye, even whilst producing this presentation, there are still things I don't understand. There are things I don't fathom. And truly, you can't fathom them just because of how amazing and unbelievable they are. The human mind is very intelligent, very powerful. But the creation of Allah is more intelligent and more powerful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, First and foremost in an ayah, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا Allah says, we will show them our signs. فِي الْآفَاقِ In the universe around them. وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ We will show them signs within themselves and around them in the universe until it becomes clear to them that this is the truth. Meaning, Islam is the truth. Meaning, Quran is the truth. Meaning, creation is the truth. Until it becomes clear to them, they will see the signs again and again and again. These aren't things that we see once and then they disappear. No. The signs of Allah are constant. Every time the sun rises and every time the sun sets and every time we see a star twinkle and every time we see the moon change its shape. The start of the month, the moon is a crescent and then it becomes bigger and bigger. And on the 14th day of the month, the moon is big, it's full. And then it starts to reduce on the other side until it's vanished again. And then we sight the new moon. So every day, constantly, the signs of Allah are visible for us to see and for us to reflect on. Another ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ardi That in the earth, there are signs for those of faith. And it's very amazing that he said, the people of faith, because... Someone that does not have faith, someone that does not have yaqeen or faith in Allah, he still sees the signs of Allah. He still sees the sun and the stars and the moon and he sees mountains and oceans and rivers. But because he hasn't faith, that sign doesn't mean anything to him. But the people of faith, when they see the signs of Allah, it means something to them. They become humbled. They become humbled in awe of the creation of Allah. And someone that is deprived from yaqeen and faith, then he becomes arrogant. He becomes arrogant. Like there have been people, I think it was the founder of Disney, I believe so, that he has paid, I don't know how many millions of dollars before he died, to have his body frozen. Because he thinks that a day will come where science finds a way to bring him back to life and he wants to come back to life. So he had these signs, but he was so arrogant. He had no faith in his heart that he died and he thinks that one day he'll come back to life. So this is arrogance, this foolishness. So Allah says, For those of faith, there are signs in the earth. And then one of my favorite ayahs, which is in red because it's probably a good idea to remember this one because of a certain quiz that will happen later. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَفَلَا تُبْصِرُونَ That inside of your own selves, in your own bodies, in your own hands, and in your own faces, there are signs. Do you not see? Do you not look? Do you not contemplate? So what is the eye? So the eye is an organ. 
like we have the heart and we have lungs and we have kidneys and we have so many different organs we have the skin which is the largest organ in the body the eye is after the brain the most complex organ really um and it's so complex that it's very difficult to explain to someone who doesn't have a basic understanding of the eye but we'll try inshallah in an easy way the way a human being sees something is through light light travels in waves and even then there's an argument is it wave or is it a particle physics they have this argument light travels in waves and the light comes from the source and it reflects off things so for example it reflects off people and trees and a microphone and a computer and anything that we see the light comes from this object and it comes straight into our eye as a wave and then we have a power in the eye we have these lenses like a camera that allows the, 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 the rays to change direction, to become narrow and diverge. And then this light reaches the back of the eye. So the eye is like, imagine a snooker ball. The eye is like a ball. So within, within our eyelids, there is like a ball and this is the eye. And the eye has a back and it has a front. The front is what everyone sees, the black hole and the color and the eyelashes. This is all the front of the eye and the back is on the other side. And the back of the eye, it just looks like vessels blood vessels so this light that we see it travels through the eye through these different systems until it reaches the back of the eye but to get there there is a process so we have the front of the eye first it goes through this then it goes through a small liquid sort of material a chamber and then we have this part of the eye which has color so mine is brown most people they have brown eyes some will have green and blue and other colors hazel this area in the middle of it, there is a black hole, which we call the pupil. People think pupil is like a structure. The pupil is just a hole. The black hole is just a hole. It's just a dip. The light goes through the dip and then it goes through a gel substance and then it reaches the back of the eye. Now in the back of the eye is what the brother said. There are some receptors, photoreceptors. Photo means light. Receptor means anything that receives something. And these receptors, they are rods or cones. And then... Within rods or cones, there are many other types. Some of them, they receive red light. Some of them receive green light. Some of them receive blue light. And light rays can mix. That's why we have so many different colors. And then this light goes through a vessel or a fiber or a nerve into the brain. And the brain then produces the image of what we see. Very simply, very, very basic. This is how it works. However, when we see something... When the light reaches into the eye, the thing, the area at the back of the eye that receives the light, it actually receives it upside down. So the brain has many functions, many jobs. Number one, the brain receives the information from the eye through electrical impulses. Once it receives the information, it has to understand what it is that we're looking at. Is it a tree? Is it a mountain? Is it a sun? Is it a car? And then it has to understand and pick up the colors is it red? Is it green? Is it black? Or is it a mixture of colors? And then it has to flip the image upside down and then we see. So it's a very long process before we actually see something. It's long in theory, but to see, it's not long. Because if you close your eye and you open, you see instantly. And this is why light is very fascinating. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ That Allah he made us in the most perfect form. So not only our the eye is perfect, but also the light is perfect. And also everything around us is perfect because one system doesn't work by itself, as I will explain in a second. Charles Darwin, who is the man who basically founded the theory of evolution, a theory that has misguided millions of people now. Charles Darwin himself, he said, himself, he said, it is absurd, meaning it's ridiculous to the highest degree, meaning... For the kids to understand this statement, he's trying to say that it is ridiculous, unbelievably ridiculous to believe that the eye was made randomly. He said, but you have to believe it. This is the level of arrogance that he himself said after studying the eye a little bit and seeing how the eye works. He said, I accept that it's absurd that we believe the eye was randomly made. He said, but you just have to accept it. This is how it is. So... Like I said, the light, as you can see in this diagram, it goes and it hits this area called the cornea and it goes straight inside and it goes right to the back of the eye. 
and there is a nerve and it takes this information to the brain and then we can see something. So imagine the eye has a power of like 60 diopters. Diopters is what we use to describe lenses. Cameras, they have lenses and phones have lenses now and eye has lenses. So the eye power is 60 diopters, which is quite a lot. The eye can see 10 million shades of color. So we think colors are just maybe six or seven colors. The eye can see and differentiate more than 10 million shades of color. Because every color has shades. There's dark and light and in between and more than 10 million shades of color can be differentiated. In the back of the eye, where these receptors are, like the brother said, rods and cones, there's more than 100 million of them alone, just in the back of the eye. So you can imagine, just to see one thing, just to see one thing, there are millions of impulses, millions of rays of light traveling from the object to the eye, then to the brain and converting it upside down. And for us, it's not even a millisecond. For us, we can see as soon as we open our eye, there's no delay. We can see straight away. And the reason for that is, is because the speed of light is the fastest thing that we know. Light is the things that we can observe in this world. Light is the quickest thing of them. Yes. I'll tell you about the dark. Light travels like something like 300 million meters per second, which is I think somewhere in between 60 to 80 million miles per hour. Light is so fast that it allows us to see. Just imagine, you know, let's say, okay, that Allah made the human eye perfectly. Let's say light wasn't that quick. Let's say light was slower. Let's say light was like sound. Imagine if there was even a delay of one second before you could see something. Imagine you're driving the car, Someone on the other side of the road, he crashes through the barrier. And because you see everything delayed by a second, because light travels slow, imagine you saw this one second late. This life would not work. People would die all the time. There'd be no safety. It's crucial that light is the speed that it is for us to respond quickly, for us to see things instantly. There's no delay. It's not even a millisecond. So imagine the eye is perfect, but imagine light wasn't quick the eye would be useless. So everything, every system individually is perfect just for us to be able to see. And the brother said, the young guy said, what is like the dark? Well, dark is just absence of light. When there is no light, there is darkness. And in fact, in complete darkness, we are blind because to see, we have to, we have, to have light. Vision is dependent upon light. So if there is complete darkness, meaning if this room was completely black, and there is no lamppost outside and there's no screen, there's no light coming from any phone, nothing, pitch black, then we are blind. Then we are blind. But the, as soon as you enter a little bit of light in the room, you can start to see some details. Okay, so we already mentioned this, how things are upside down. You can see the dog. The light from the dog goes into the eye and there is a small upside down dog in the back of the eye. And then it goes through the fiber into the brain and then the brain pictures the dog back in the right direction and the same size as the dog that we saw uh, in the distance. So these are all things happening simultaneously all the time, millions of them happening every second. And again, So after you learn something like that and after you realize the complex nature of the eye, you question, look at the signs that Allah he placed inside of us. Now, one thing that I'm sure people probably thought, why do people have to wear glasses? Some people... The eyes can be too powerful or they can be under yani, uh, not enough power in the eye. So we have to have glasses to correct this. So the top eye is the normal eye. There's a candle, the lights go into the eye and you see the candle at the back. Then you have something called nearsightedness. Most people, they have nearsightedness, they wear glasses because the candle, if you look at the back, is focusing not on the back, it's a little bit in front of the back. The eye is too powerful, it focuses it too quickly. You have to have glasses to correct that. And then at the bottom, this is farsightedness, which is where the eye is not powerful enough and the candle focuses behind the eye. So you have to have glasses to help that. And then there is something called astigmatism, which is a mixture of both things. And this is the reason we have to sometimes wear glasses because our eyes are either too powerful or sometimes the eye is not powerful enough. So the lens of the glasses helps to adjust that difference. So enough about the science. We're here to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're here to renew our faith. What do the eyes mean for a Muslim? First and foremost, there's a hadith in which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The hurrimat al-naru ala aini 
دمعت من خشية الله عز وجل that the hellfire is forbidden for the eyes that weep from the fear of Allah hellfire is forbidden is haram for the eye of a servant that weeps because of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وحرمت النار على عين سهرت في سبيل الله and likewise the hellfire is haram forbidden not allowed for the eye that is vigilant in the way of Allah and likewise حرمت النار على عين غضت من عن محارم الله that the hellfire is also not allowed and haram and prohibited for the eye that lowers its gaze from what Allah has forbidden so there is a hadith specifically about the eye this one and there are others as well that you can save yourself from the hellfire just by your human eye just by the eye of course you have to pray your salah and you have to fast and you have to do the things that Allah made obligatory upon you but you can save yourself from the fire of hell just by your eye and when Rasulullah said حُرِّمَةِ النَّارِ meaning the hellfire is prohibited this means that it's haram for the hellfire it's not allowed to touch you if your eyes can do these three things number one your eye cries because of the fear of Allah you remember something you hear something you read something and the love of Allah in your heart it sprouts and the fear of Allah in your heart it grows and you shed a tear that tear that you shed from your eye will be an evidence for you on your al qiyamah inshallah likewise someone who uses his eyes in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and likewise someone who lowers his gaze from the things that Allah has made haram these three forms of the eye Allah says through Rasulullah that the hellfire will not touch this person eyes can be your ticket to Jannah but also the eyes can be someone's downfall and to be honest to be honest you will find most people astray most people in Jahannam a lot of them many hadith are about this the reasons for a person's entry into Jahannam one of them being the tongue one of them being the eye so the eye is something that is very powerful it can help you but the eye wallahi it can destroy you and more people you will find destroyed than you will find guided because the eye is an avenue it's a way for something to enter the heart as Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah said that the heart is an organ inside here in the chest the most important organ of the body the heart can become corrupt the heart can become clean things enter the heart through many ways through your ears you listen to something it enters the heart you eat something it enters the heart you see something it enters the heart there are avenues there are streets that lead to the heart through your eyes, through your nose, through your ears, through your mouth. So to protect your eyes is crucial. To protect your eyes is crucial because it will be the difference between having a heart that is pure and having a heart that is corrupt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam najallahu aynain in Surah Balad. That have we not made for him as in human being a pair of eyes? So the eyes are an important way for us to communicate with the world. We see things, we understand things. There are so many things that we, for example, the hadith, maybe you know that there will be a man on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, he will say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will be told that you can enter Jannah with the mercy of Allah. And he's someone that lived for several, several hundred years and he worshipped Allah for hundreds of years. So he will say, oh Allah, don't enter me into Jannah because of your mercy enter me into Jannah because of my actions because he lived for so many hundreds of years and he was a pious man so he wants to know his actions how much weight they have so Allah will tell the angels okay just remove his eyesight that's it just remove his eyesight and instantly most of his deeds will be gone because how many deeds how many, how many actions do we do because of our eyesight walking to the masjid your eyes allowed you to do that Driving to the mosque, your eyes allowed you to do that. Going for hajj, your eyes allowed you to do that. Reading Quran, your eyes allowed you to do that. Learning any dua, to learn it, you had to see or you had to read, your eyes allowed you to do that. So if Allah removes this one thing from you, one thing, we have nothing left. So then the person, he repented and then Allah, he entered him back into the Jannah. So this is what this ayah means. That Allah has made for us eyes, for us to use to our own benefit. Likewise, in this ayah at the bottom, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ ذَرَعْنَا لِجَهَنَّمَ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ 
لَهُمْ قُلُوبُ لَا يَفْقَحُونَ بِهَا That there are people from the humans and the jinn. They have hearts, but they don't understand. وَلَهُمْ أَعْيُنُ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ بِهَا They have eyes, but they don't see. وَلَهُمْ آذَانُ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا They have ears, but they don't hear. أُولَئِكَ كَالْأَنْعَامِ بَلْهُمْ أَضَلْ They are like animals. If not, they are even worse than animals. So you can have eyes, as Allah says, but you don't see anything. You can have a heart, but you don't understand anything. You can have ears, but you don't hear anything. Because someone who has all of these things, but he dies upon kufr, then did he really see anything? Did he really hear anything? Did he really understand anything? No. His life was a life that was wasted. But someone, he has these organs and he's able to see, meaning he lives a life upon guidance. So you can have vision, but be blind. You can have vision, but be blind. You can have hearing, but be deaf. So it's how the person uses these things that allows him to take benefit of them. So the vision of a human being, it really affects the heart, you know. So Allah says here, in the first ayah regarding those people that they have a barrier, a veil between remembrance of Allah because they are unable to see. So these are people that have vision but they don't remember Allah because their vision is like them, it's like them being blind. Allah placed a veil there and even though they see, they are unable to worship and remember Allah. Likewise, Allah, there's a hadith here that says that I look is like a poisonous dart from the darts of shaitan. That you look at something, it's like a poisonous arrow that has been dipped in poison and it's been shot into your chest. A lot of the sins that people do, for example, men. Let's talk about men. A lot of the sins that men do is through the eyes. As we know, that zina can be zina of the eyes, of the hands, of the ears. Someone, he looks at something and because he looked, he becomes tempted by the lust and he falls into a sin. Someone, he looks at something, he becomes ungrateful of his own blessings. Someone has a small car, he sees a big car, he becomes ungrateful. So how many sins do we do because of our eyes? How many things do we look at because of our eyes? And even though you might not fall into the sin straight away, once that thing entered your body through your eyes, it sits in your chest and it taps away at you like this. Taps away, taps away, taps away. That's why the first glance is halal, the second glance is haram. And then this black thing, this black dot in the heart that's entered, it grows and it grows and it grows until it takes you to a place where you end up committing that sin. And all of that chain was because of the fact that you looked at something that was haram for you. As this statement at the bottom from a great imam, he says that one look after another will sow the seeds of desire in the heart and it's sufficient temptation for the person that you look once, maybe you can fight it. You look the second time, it becomes harder. You look the third time, it becomes even harder. Slowly, 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 these seeds will keep planting. And because of your eyesight, eventually, the temptation becomes too strong and you fall into the sin. And that can be any sin. Of course, when it comes to vision, a lot of the narrations is regarding looking at the opposite gender. Looking at that which is haram, lowering, lowering your gaze. But this is not only from the opposite gender. This is from anything. Anything that someone looks at that causes temptation in his heart. I'll give you an example. Some brothers, they involve themselves with the wrong crowd, okay? And the friends that they are with, maybe some of them they smoke, maybe some of them they do something, drugs, or maybe some of them they drink or they go to places that are haram. And he's with them all the time, he's looking at them, he's seeing them do these sins. Even that requires you to lower your gaze. So it's not only about looking at the opposite gender, it's looking at any haram, any sin. Because you keep looking and looking until it becomes normal for you. And until that seed, it begins to grow inside of your heart and it causes the temptation to become too strong. And before we finish, inshallah, just some actual informative things about the eye. Because to be honest, a lot of the Muslim community in the UK, we are from the South Asian background. Of course, there are many people from Arab backgrounds and there are rever reverse Muslims and there are people from all different parts of the globe. But the majority of the Muslim population in the UK is from the South Asian background. And there are some things that we have in our society, eye related illnesses that are becoming out of control because we don't pay attention to them. Okay. 
The Prophet وسلم, said, He said there are two blessings that most people they waste. Two blessings most people they waste. As-sihhatu wal faragh Health and time. People waste their time and people waste their health. So it's from Islam that we look after our health. It's from the deen of Allah that you pay heed and attention to your health. One of the most common forms of eye sort of diseases or issues that we face as humans is cataracts. Sometimes cataracts is not because of anything that we did. Sometimes cataracts is because of age. And there's nothing you can do to prevent that. Why? Because death has no cure. As you become older, your body becomes weaker, preparing you for death. And death is a disease that has no cure. So sometimes cataract is something that happens naturally because of age. But sometimes, in fact, a lot of the times, cataract can be helped. Cataract is when the eye becomes white. As it says here, cataract is something that we have in the back of our eye, a lens. It's like glass. And with age, the glass becomes dirty, like cloudy. When it starts to become cloudy, you can start seeing whiteness in the eye. As you can see, his eye in the middle is not black, it's white or her. And that whiteness is what we call a cataract. When your eye becomes white and cloudy, it affects your vision because you can't see clearly anymore. Alhamdulillah, there's ways to treat this. There's surgery and many other things that you can treat it. But it's something that can be prevented still by making some life changes. For example, smoking causes this to happen a lot quicker, okay? In fact, smoking cigarettes is a risk factor for most diseases on the face of this earth. The reason I wanted to mention this is because I found something very interesting about the cataract. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran regarding the story of Musa alayhi uh, Yusuf alayhi salam. If anyone knows the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, his father Yaqub became blind because of the sorrow and the sadness of losing Yusuf. He became blind. That's what they tell you when they when the, uh, the teachers, they teach the story of Yusuf, that's how they say it. But in the Quran, in the Quran, Allah says, Allah says that Ya'qub السلام, because of the sadness and sorrow of Yusuf, his eyes became white. His eyes became white. And that led to him losing his vision. So it's, I think it's a fair thing to say that Ya'qub actually developed a cataract. So subhanAllah, cataract is something referenced in Quran from 1400 years back. And even then the story of Ya'qub is even a long time before Rasulullah. So this is something that Allah has mentioned, made reference to in Quran regarding the cataract, which is something that we only have been able to treat maybe in the last couple hundred years. Another eye disease that is very common is something called glaucoma. Glaucoma, sometimes people don't know how they have it. They go to an optometrist, they have an eye test and they realize they have it. Sometimes it has no symptoms. But again, glaucoma is something that can happen with age and also it can happen because if someone in the family has it and again, smoking and things like that make these things worse. Glaucoma is when the nerve in the back of the eye becomes damaged. So the nerve that goes to your brain, it becomes damaged because of some reasons and this causes glaucoma. So anyone that feels like their vision in one eye Especially, this is one of the things to find out if you have glaucoma sometimes, that vision in one eye becomes a little bit affected. The other eye is fine, but one eye, it becomes blurry. Or sometimes you have pain or something in one eye and the other eye seems okay. Or sometimes you have some problem in one eye and the other eye seems okay. And also, if you have anyone in your family that has something called glaucoma and you experience anything like that, it's always good to go get it checked out straight away. And the last thing, diabetes. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect us. Wallahi, diabetes is a killer, a silent killer. And diabetes is something that our people have neglected a great deal. Even within our own families, our parents, or our grandparents, or our siblings, or our uncles. Many of them are diabetic and they treat it like it's something very normal. It's okay, don't worry. It happens to everyone. No, Wallahi, diabetes is a silent killer. Diabetes is very, very, very dangerous. Diabetes can lead to blindness. In fact, in 2011, which is more than 10 years ago, now it's even more than this. More than half a million people in the UK were at risk of blindness just because of diabetes. So people think diabetes is just because of sugar levels in the body. And if you take the tablet or if you take an injection, if you're born with it, then you'll be okay. No, diabetes causes death. Diabetes causes amputation of limbs. People have to have their feet cut off because of infection because of diabetes. Diabetes causes blindness in millions of people. So anyone that has diabetes, which is a lot of people in our South Asian background, 
you really, really need to pay attention to this. Wallahi, it's from the deen, like I said, ni'matani maghboonun fihi ma kathirun minan nas as The health is one of the things that the Prophet of Allah told you to look after. It's imperative that you look after your health. It's a blessing from Allah and it's an amana from Allah that you have to go back to Him. So someone that has diabetes, urgently you have to control it. Your blood levels, sugar levels, the way you eat, your diet, your exercise, it has to be in check straight away, immediately. Because it can cause more complications than you can possibly even imagine. And the last thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask Him that He grants us ability to understand His creation and to appreciate it. And most importantly, like I said, the eyes are a means for someone to enter Jannah, likewise are a means for someone to enter the hellfire as well. So we ask Allah that He makes our eyes an evidence for us and not against us on Yawm Al Qiyamah, a day that will come very, very quickly, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wama amru sa'ati illa kalamhi basar. That the decision, the day of judgment, will be the twinkling of an eye. Will be the twinkling of an eye. And just before I finish, inshallah, the youngsters that are here, I encourage you to pursue like these sort of fields, fields where there's healthcare is involved because you are helping other people with their health. As Imam Shafi'i said, there are two sciences that are worthy of my time and worthy of studying. Number one is the science of the deen, fiqh, understanding the laws of Allah. Number two is the science of medicine, understanding the body and how to treat people. Because it's a worship, if you have the right intention, it's a worship that you help people with their health. You treat them, you give them cure, you help them by the will of Allah. This can be a, a means of your, uh, a means of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saving you on your al Qiyamah because of the charitable actions that you did throughout your life. And also, it's important that the Muslim, he takes care of his health. We are very quick to increase ourselves, which is very good in, in ibadah, in worship and fasting and giving zakah and giving charity and praying. And these are things that will take a person into Jannah without a doubt. But your health is an amana. It's something that Allah gave to you. It's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not everyone has vision. Not everyone has perfect health. So those of us that do have these things, we need to look after them. We need to treat them in the best of way. And this does not only mean to treat them in the best of way medically, also spiritually. Don't use your eyes for something that will damage your heart. It's not only an amana that you look after it by, you know, medically and eating right and exercising. No, don't use your body for things that are sinful, things that are haram, because even these things will be questioned. Even this is an amana that Allah gave you, that you use your hand to commit this sin and you use your eyes to commit that sin. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us tawfiq to implement some of that which we learned.